So I will, I am, um, uh, my area of expertise is algorithms and machine learning, and I will talk about AI for health from that perspective. Okay. So let me start with a very short story. I was a PhD student at UCLA, and I had a very good friend who later became a radiologist, and we haven't seen each other since 2011. Then in 2016, this friend gave me a frantic call and said, uh, it looks like I have to switch, uh, I have to leave radiology, it looks like uh, something horrible will happen and AI will replace me. I guess many of you in this room know what happened, right? But in case you don't, let me remind you, 2016, uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, who is many considered to be a father of modern deep learning, said something like that. Let me read this. I think it's very important. I think if you work as a radiologist, you like the coyote that's already over the edge of the cliff but hasn't yet looked down. People should stop training radiologists now. It's just completely obvious within five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. It might be 10 years, but we got plenty of radiologists already. Okay, so I must tell you, if I would be a radiologist in 2016, I would be scared as well. But today is 2023, and it looks like we still have radiologists, right? Even though it's three years more to go, but uh, I'm kind of, I called my friend recently and many of of my friends who are radiologists, and they kind of, uh, you know, okay, let me not repeat what they said, but um, uh, so it's kind of, didn't pan out, right? And let me tell you why I think one of the reasons it didn't uh, work out, right? And uh, I want to quote another a very famous uh, machine learning researcher. And I guess maybe this is a very famous quote for anyone who works in ML, but maybe less uh, known to people who work in medicine. This is uh, Ali Rahimi uh, giving a keynote on his theme of Test of Time Award in New Rips 2017, a major uh, conference in machine learning. Uh, he said something like that. Machine learning has become alchemy. I would like to live in a society whose systems are built on top of verifiable rigorous sorrow knowledge and not on alchemy. As aggravating as a New Rips rigor police was, I miss them and I wish they come back. Let me give you two comments here. First of all, just in case you don't remember what alchemy is. It's essentially a pseudoscience, right? It's one of the goals of pseudoscience. Uh, it was in um, Middle Ages that, you know, they, they claimed that they will be able to turn, um, let's say, bronze into gold, stuff like that. And the second uh, claim is rigor police. Who is rigor police? Uh, that was a team, a, a group of machine learning theoreticians who um, essentially like proofs. And they want to see when you have a claim that this claim is actually true. Um, so the main point of today's talk is that, I, okay, let me, maybe police is not the right word, but I do, I want to claim that we need a rigor team in health, in FOIA and healthcare. And I'll try to convey this message today. Okay. Uh, before uh, I continue, let me say, so I will talk first of all about some past and ongoing collaborations just to uh, give you an example of what uh, my team has been working on. And hopefully convey that I'm not a complete outsider to medical uh, community. Then I will try to emphasize, give you uh, examples of why. And I've seen these examples today and yesterday during the panel, right? M many people already uh, explained this, but I want to visualize it. I, I, I think I played with um, some subtle models and it kind of surprised me what I saw. Um, and uh, then I want to s essentially say what I would like to propose. Hopefully will happen in the next uh, 10 to 15 years and give you some examples of what we already have done. Okay, so let me start with this. So first of all, I've been very lucky to work with, I'm, again, I'm not a medical researcher, but I've been lucky to work with many fantastic medical researcher um, for many years. In fact, one of them is Professor Michael Jacobs right here from uh, UT Health, who essentially introduced me to the world of medical research. So thank you so much. And um, uh, um, 
He is a vice chair of research and director of MRI research here at the uh, uh, Department of Diagnostic and Interventional Imaging, right? And uh, we started working together probably seven or eight years ago, right? While we both were at Johns Hopkins, right? So I moved to Rice uh, um, a bit more than a year ago. And when I called Mike um, and told him, you know, I'm leaving, he told me I'm leaving as well. And uh, so we, we, we are both now here, which is awesome. So we wrote multiple papers on medical imaging. Uh, we advise students and uh, hopefully we'll do more, even more great work. Right? Uh, another ongoing collaboration is with uh, Dr. Mandal from Baylor. Uh, this is uh, uh, funded by recent award by uh, Baylor Instinct and Rice and Rich. And we're trying to uh, improve uh, prediction rate for uh, stroke in patients with uh, heart failure. We essentially, it's patient with artificial heart. It's very interesting research and going. I cannot say more than that. And you know, hopefully, we'll see our first paper in about a month. And then if you want to follow up, I'll be happy to, to send you this paper. Here is another research. Uh, that been going for more than a year now as well. This is very interesting. It's, uh, we try to detect arrhythmia uh, from uh, data that we receive from wearable devices. Uh, and this data is very noisy, so that makes it very challenging. It's a collaboration with a team from uh, Korean University, from Harlem University in South Korea, with Johns Hopkins and with a Korean company called Mizu. And this research is funded by uh, Korean government, actually. So it's a challenging and very interesting project. Again, probably the first paper will come out in about a month or two, and I'll be happy to follow up. Great, so hopefully I convince you that I'm not a complete outsider to medical research, and actually during those collaborations, these ideas of why we need something more grounding, why we need more uh, provable guarantees came to my mind. So let me first try to visualize give you a bit concrete examples of what, in my opinion, is wrong with modern um, deep learning and machine learning models. So I played, I took uh, two probably the most uh, recent models. One is Dream Studio, it's a fusion-based uh, fusion model, right? And I just play with it, right? For this one, I ask it to draw me a unicorn on a bike eating ice cream. Um, if I would be an artist, I would really enjoy this picture, which I am actually, I really enjoy it. But if you're an engineer and if you look a bit carefully, you see that there are many things that are wrong, right? First of all, uh, the unicorn is not eating ice cream. And uh, second of all, it's actually not a unicorn on a bike, it's kind of a hybrid between unicorn and a bike. You see the leg kind of uh, connects to. Okay, great. And so this is kind of consistent, right? So if I do this, it's another picture. I ask, uh, draw me a cat who is approving the Pythagorean theorem, right? And the uh, cat is fantastic. And uh, what you see here kind of looks like a Pythagorean theorem at the bottom here, but it's nothing. I mean, this is basically gibberish, right? Uh, good. So next example, I went to ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a fantastic tool. Been, you know, many people talked about this yesterday and today, right? My son plays with it, my, my, my 11 years old son plays with it and enjoys it a lot. And in many cases, it provides really fantastic results, right? But not always, right? And here is a very simple example. I gave it uh, questions that are a bit tricky, right? Not a straightforward. So, Proof that 10,005 is a prime number, right? Which is not, right? It's, uh, if you remember what prime number is, right? It means that it's only divisible by itself and one, right? Good. And so it gave, if you look at this, let's say if you don't know what prime numbers are, right? Or if, if you forgot, you look at this, it looks very convincing. This proof looks, in fact, this proof is almost correct, right? If you look, if I would prove this, I would write exactly this, right? So you need to check that every number is, uh, you know, that my, that my number 10,005 is divisible by every number, right? Check it, just check. You don't have to check, they actually did some optimization. You don't need to check for every number, just square root. 
So they, it's a correct, uh, uh, correct idea that you only need to check up to 101. And then everything looks great, except for very few little details. For example, in here in line two, uh, okay, in line two here, right, it says 10,005, if I divide it by three, I get 3,335, I think it's correct, which is not a whole number, right? And then blah, 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 blah. So you do it uh, 101 additional calculation, but this essentially it fails, right? So it need make an incorrect conclusion that indeed 10,005 is a prime number. Great, and it's not, again, it's not rare, let me put it this way. So as long, my, in my observation, right, as long as you give a sufficiently tricky question, it fails. And it doesn't fail uh, in an obvious way, right? You, you actually need to think to find out what's wrong, right? It's kind of like a student who didn't get exactly the topic, but heard a lot of things about this topic, right? And writes almost correct proof. But if you don't catch this one line, you will give him an A or, or, her, or they, right? So here is another example. Proves that pi divided by 34 is a rational number, right? Which again is not. Right, and then you look at this, and it's a very convincing proof, long proof. Again, if I would try to prove this, I would use something like that. And uh, I actually don't remember where it fails now. We need to take a look. Yes, maybe you can guess, right? So here, everything is good, but then pi divided by 34, blah, 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 blah. They say decimal representation of pi divided by 34 is not infinite, which, which is not true. Right. But it's hard to say. Okay, great. So hopefully I convince you that, and you already know this, I'm not saying anything new, that we cannot always trust modern um, machine learning and deep learning models, right? And let me take this statement to the next level. And in fact, you know, if we cannot trust a model to know basic mathematical facts, for example, take it to extreme, is two plus two always equal to four. Then we can apply what is known as a explosion principle, right? X falso quadli bet, right? Which means from falsehood, anything, right? If you have one wrong assumption, you can prove anything you want. Right? And this, in my opinion, is very problematic, especially in areas where we deal with life and death, such as healthcare. And that's exactly the point of today's talk, okay? But as again, we discussed today and yesterday in many cases, the reality is that AI is here, right? We cannot say, you know, okay, we, we cannot do anything, right? I mean, we, it's, it's already here. In fact, uh, I looked it up, right? The numbers are different, but uh, the hundreds in some other uh, sources I saw more than 500, uh, AI-based algorithms or devices have been approved by FDA already, right? So they are coming to hospitals. Maybe they, some of them are already in the hospitals. So does it mean if it was approved, does it mean that it's really reliable and maybe we missed something? Well, in the same, this is a, a picture from FDA website. If you go down to this uh, web page, right, they give several links, and I found one of those papers. This is an excellent work by a team from Stanford. And uh, they essentially took several, many uh, FDA-approved algorithms, AI algorithms, and tried to see how well they generalize. Right? What do I mean by generalize? How, work they, they, how, how well they work on new data set, right? And not very surprisingly, they, they say something like this. Across the board, we found substantial drop-offs in model performance for the model we evaluated on a different site. In other words, the same thing. If you, if you change the data a little bit, it can, maybe it doesn't fail, but the um, significant uh, reduction in performance, right? I spoke informally, so many of my thoughts based on anecdotal evidence I spoke informally with many uh, medical researchers and clinicians, and one of the comments, maybe most frequent comments that I got, 
Well, yes, this is true, but at least the majority of this FDA approved uh, algorithms are um, designed to be uh, decision support tools. In other words, they're going to be a clinician in the loop, somebody who will check. There, right? And uh, this might be very well true, and uh, this may be a way forward, but uh, we also know, so let's say when I got a new car, right, and this car has some new features, I will, I will tend to rely on those features, right? even though maybe they will not work 100% uh, time. Right? You probably saw this uh, recent news that uh, Tesla car crashed on aut autopilot, and now actually the driver is, it looks to be, it seems to be liable. Right. Uh, so the same paper, right, says something that I found very interesting. A prospective randomized study may reveal that clinicians are misusing this tool for primary diagnostic and the, for, for primary diagnosis. Right. In other words, at some point they may maybe over rely on those tools. Very nice. And so this is not the only paper, right? Actually, I only included two, but there are dozens of papers that say very similar things, right? They look at studies, systematic studies, at proposed algorithms, and they find across the board that uh, there is a, maybe some uh, decrease in performance, and in, many, in some cases here they found in a quarter of all algorithms there was a significant reduction in performance, okay? So looks like, um, this is a problem, right? And again, I'm not saying something new. Many people know that this is a problem. In fact, FDA knows that this is a problem. And as one of the ways to mitigate this, they recently introduced what is known as good machine learning practice, guiding principles, right? 10 principles which are really great and fantastic to, in my opinion. But um, what I wanted to say today, I think something is missing here, or at least, uh, some of these principles should be expanded to include what I wanted to propose next. Okay, great. Let me now try to convince you that this is what we need. We need something uh, with provable guarantees. What do I mean by that? Um, in my opinion, we need to extend these good principles to include something like that, maybe something else, but Essentially, what needs to happen, we need to have many, many discussions about this. First of all, and this is not only for uh, healthcare, it's generally for uh, practical AI, we need a comprehensive theory for uh, deployed machine learning models and algorithms. Right? That, in, in the case of healthcare, would complement empirical studies and clinical trials. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well. You maybe see some papers like this, right? This is one of our papers. Right? We look at machine learning as a mathematical problem, right? What do I mean by that? Well, you have a problem definition here, right? You, you try to define, to model uh, what you want to com compute. You have some assumptions, right? This model, hopefully, in this case, we're talking about uh, multi-objective reinforcement learning. This model uh, tries to uh, capture a real need in practice, right? In this case, the reality is that in many cases, uh, when we do reinforcement learning, we only need to optimize not only one objective, but maybe five or six objectives, right? And then we have uh, actual mathematical proof in our case that the policy that we will output will be close to optimal policy, okay? So in our case, and if you think, so for reinforcement learning, this is maybe a bit more well-defined, but even for deep learning models, right, we, can, we want to guarantee bound the loss of the model, no matter what kind of data you will receive, okay? That's one example. Another example, that in our, uh, another recent paper, uh, we tried to compress uh, machine learning models, again, with provable guarantees, right? This, this here, here we try to address a different problem, that uh, models could be too large to be deployed in, uh, let's say, in hospitals or in, in practice. And again, we have something, very simple algorithm, but at the end, we prove a theorem that uh, the performance of the original model is similar to the performance to the, comp to the compressed models, and so on and so forth. And here is yet another example, and this is a topic of uh, continual learning. Uh, as you probably know, continual learning means that you want to model 
that faces several uh, different tasks, right? And I will show an example of this uh, in, in a few minutes. And uh, we would like to train the model incrementally on each task without retraining on everything, right? And we hope that when we train on task five, the model does not forget what it knew on task one, right? In other words, we want to avoid what is known as catastrophic forgetting in continual learning. Again, you can, what people typically do, right? They, they, they train it, they, they run um, experiments and uh, uh, show exp uh, empirical results. What in my opinion should also happen, should be complemented, is actual proof. In this case, we can show that there is an upper bound on the total loss uh, and we can uh, characterize it precisely in this case. So in, in other words, upper and lower bound. Not only we can show an improvement, but no one else can uh, probably get it better. Good. So hopefully, maybe in five or 10 years, this theoretical um, uh, uh, guarantees will catch up with what is happening in SOTA models today. But this is not the case right now. So this is not the only way, um, probably this, this way will, will not help us in the next five to 10 years. So what we need uh, now, what we need uh, in the short term is at the very least we need education. And I think I'm, I'm repeating what already been said in the last two days, but let me try to be a bit more precise. What do I mean by education? I think we need to train people, and uh, we, we call them pi researchers, right? People with two, so pi has two legs, right? With two types of expertise. In our case, people who has an expertise in medical research and in theoretical machine learning, right? We also need to co-teach courses that would uh, combine those two, uh, those two types of expertise. And I am very proud that we have, in my opinion, an example of such researcher, and this is a Vishwa Parekh, Professor Vishwa Parekh, who was co-advised by me and uh, Mike Jacobs here. Uh, he is currently uh, a, a tenure track faculty at UMD and technical director of University of Maryland Med Medical Intelligent Imaging Center. And uh, he has an extensive expertise and training, both in radiology, radiomics, machine learning, and algorithms. So I think people like that will drive this uh, innovation uh, um, forward while ensuring that at least, you know, the models that we use are at least not too crazy. And uh, another thing that I want to say, right, uh, courses, new courses. So I'm designing um, a new course for spring 2024 at Rice University where I will hope to at least scratch the surface of what we just covered, right? So hopefully we'll see some theoretical uh, methods and machine learning for uh, medical, uh, for computational medicine and, and digital health. I will be happy to talk about this offline, get your feedback on this, uh, but this course is coming and if you're interested, you know, anyone who is uh, affiliated with RISE can take it as well. Last but not least, let me say may maybe the most important thing to mitigate this, um, uh, you know, problems of generalization and machine learning is that I think if you want to really deliver something robust to uh, medical research, we need to start uh, very strong collaborations between theoreticians and medical researchers from, from the beginning of every project. And I want to give an example of our project with, again, with Professor Jacobs. This is, um, so let me come back to this. This is a recent uh, project that just uh, finished, uh, funded by DARPA, DARPA Shell program. It was a collaboration between UCLA, UT Health, Hopkins and Rice and UMD as well. It resulted in multiple publications and the publication is still um, uh, being produced. Uh, let me maybe say, how much time do I have? Okay, so let me very briefly maybe say, the reason I want to show this is actually it connects to uh, the theoretical results that I showed a few minutes ago, right? So here we were tasked with uh, the following problem. It's a distributed setting, 
right? Uh, multiple reinforcement learning agents. Jointly, they want to learn a sequence of tasks on medical imaging. Let me show you an example of these tasks, right? Tasks are defined by different uh, modalities of MRI images, uh, different orientations, and uh, different pathologies. Okay, so every agent gets a sequence of such tasks, and uh, they want to share knowledge among themselves to speed up the learning and, and to improve performance. Very exciting, very challenging problem. We spent uh, about two years working on this and obtained very nice results. Let me show you the results. Uh, most importantly, right, so on the left you see what was uh, the state of art when we started, and on the right what we achieved. So the several, in my opinion, uh, things that I want to emphasize. First of all, we went from uh, expensive GPUs to essentially uh, CPUs running on laptops, and this relates to the compression result that I showed. Second of all, we were able to scale from four agents to more than uh, 240, 250 agents. And that's related to the second uh, result on reinforcement learning that I explained as well. And most importantly, this system still you know, doesn't have uh, the provable guarantee for the entire system as, as you know, we would hope to see maybe in five years from today. But it have multiple components with provable guarantees. Right? And in my opinion, this is the way to go. Right? This is a way to design uh, you know, medical systems. Right? There is no silver bullet. But if we work together, we at least can ensure that, you know, out of, if, if you have a very large system with 10 connections, right, out of the 10 connections, seven works properly, right, and three we can control maybe in some other way. So this is the main message of uh, my talk today. I did not talk about many other things where we also, in my opinion, need provable guarantees, but many people talk about this uh, today and yesterday. Among those things, algorithmic fairness, right? We actually have a lot of work on this. Uh, differential privacy, everything that's related to privacy and data sharing and federated learning. Continual learning, again, you know, I think it's very important. Adaptivity to new tasks, right? If you deploy a model, right, what happens if, if the task changes? Can we rely on this model? It has already been deployed in, in the hospital. And adversarial robustness of algorithmic stability. I don't know how relevant it is to medical community, but uh, I'm, I'll be happy to talk about this as well. Uh, so let me finish by uh, giving huge uh, uh, thanks to all my collaborators. Many of them are from TMC and a fantastic set of my students, uh, Thomas, Jason, Kushbu, and uh, anyone else. In case I forgot somebody, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for bringing up that important conversation. Um, any quick questions? Because I, I think, you know, I'd encourage everybody to kind of talk after this, because I think, you know, what Bob is bringing up is super important, and everybody needs to be involved in this conversation and the follow-up. Thank you guys so much.